Okay, good evening and welcome to everybody. Um, my name is Rifile Masekela. Um, I am uh, the Vice President of the Pan-African Thoracic Society. And it's, it's really my great pleasure today to invite, um, to um, welcome everybody to our really inaugural Pan-African Thoracic Society and ERS uh, webinar. This, will, this is actually a first uh, of the series of the PATS ERS webinar. Uh, it's the first one in 2021. Um, before we carry on, I'd really like to acknowledge the PATS leadership as well as the EXCO for really accepting the idea of us to take this uh, forward with the ERS leadership as well. And I would like to also say thank you very much to Marielle Pagenberg for saying yes without any doubt when the idea was punted to her that we should really have these joint webinars between PATH and ERS. Um, and really the aim of these webinars is for us to address uh, issues of mutual interest for both of our societies that are of interest both in Africa as well as in Europe and to really share best practice and um, to disseminate knowledge to both our continents um, through these mutual topics of interest for pediatrics. So I would also like to invite everybody to join us for our next webinar, which will be hosted on the 15th of April. Uh, and the next one will be on the reducing burden of community acquired pneumonia in children and how we address interventions in this key area. So really welcome to everybody. Um, and I hope that this is a, a start of a great uh, and a wonderful webinar series for pediatricians all around the world. And um, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's um, uh, Professor Diane Gray. Uh, Diane Gray is an associate professor. Uh, she's a pediatric pulmonologist and a clinician researcher in the Department of Pediatrics and, and Child Health at Red Cross War Memorial Hospital, which is in, in the, at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Her focus of her work is really in improving pediatric respiratory health in African children through a better understanding of drivers of lung disease in early childhood. She is actually a key individual to talk on the topic of the uh, title today because she's one of the core investigators who really spearheaded a collaborative multi site study, which is uh, called Backpack. It's bronchiectasis in African children, prevalence, etiology, and clinical outcome study, which is a multi center study in, based in South Africa. And today she's going to be talking to us. The topic of her title is bronchiectasis, an African approach to diagnosis. Diane, thank you very much for agreeing to give us um, uh, this talk and I look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rafiwe, for that introduction. Can you see my slides and hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and thank you also for spearheading um, these webinars. Uh, and uh, and that you know non CF bronchiectasis is, is a very important cause of chronic lung disease for many of us working in child health and an area that we can probably do better in with the knowledge we already have, but an area that really is in need of of more data. So I think it's an excellent topic to kick off the series. Um, and thank you for inviting me to to talk. Um, I don't have any conflict of interest. So apart from research funding, which is um, not relevant to the content of this talk. Um, I'm going to be starting um, with uh, the discussing the epidemiology and pathogenesis and a diagnostic approach to bronchiectasis. Um, and then Prof Mareka will carry on with management. So hopefully overall, um, between the two of us, you'll have a good up to date of the current knowledge of childhood bronchiectasis. I'm going to be particularly focusing on how we can use our current knowledge in areas of low um, resource, because I think this is a setting where the burden of bronchiectasis is highest. Um, I 
uh, will be um, to this end trying to highlight some of the key concepts in pediatric bronchiectasis, discuss the pathogenesis in relation to a framework for approaching case recognition and assessment, hopefully present some of the African experience of children with chronic separative lung disease and simulate some discussion on the way forward in prevention and care of children with bronchiectasis. In Africa, we have particular challenges when it comes to bronchiectasis. This is, is an area with limited data and we have near, uh, you know, even less. There's limited access to chest CT scans in most parts of Africa. Uh, and this is currently the disease defining tool. In addition, we have limited access to many diagnostics, including testing for PCD and cystic fibrosis and management tools like microbiology and lung function. And of course, we have a high prevalence of risk factors for bronchiectasis, not least high incidences of low respiratory tract infections, tuberculosis, HIV, and social um, disadvantage. Now, globally, it's appreciated that bronchiectasis is more common than initially thought, and, and increasing incidence is seen in high and low income countries. Um, we don't have robust pediatric prevalence data, and it's quite variable between cohorts. But overall, it's, it, it's more common in socially disadvantaged communities, whether in high income or low income settings. The, the table on the screen is a very busy table. Um, it represents, uh, it's a table from a, uh, a review by McCullum and colleagues looking at the epidemiology of pediatric bronchiectasis in all the public da published data to date. And the only reason I've got it up here is just to make the point that the data that's included is mostly from Australasia, North America and Europe with little from elsewhere, um, but certainly none from Africa or South America, both countries countries that probably have quite a high burden of, of bronchiectasis. Globally, there's a trend in increasing hospitalization and, um, from bronchiectasis and mortality, and this is associated strongly with age, sex, um, socioeconomic status, severity, and comorbidities, most notably asthma and COPD. Now we know that bronchiectasis is the end result of a continuum of chronic infection and chronic inflammation. And I present this um, framework, which was suggested by Chang Bush and Grimwood, as a useful way of thinking about the clinical and pathological progression in relation to uh, causes, uh, risk factors, and, and, uh, and opportunities for intervention. So, because um, the, the important message I want to get across is that early intervention has been shown to halt, halt or reverse this process and could improve outcome. So if we're looking at the green box, an, an initial trigger can, can set off early persistent infection. Um, we could intervene here, treat this as in protracted bacterial bronchitis and exit this continuum towards damage. Um, all of this can go on to um, chronic inflammation that causes endothelial endobronchial injury with mucociliary disruption and the classic chronic productive cough that we see with chronic separative lung disease, but not yet um, airway damage. And if this is not inter um, interrupted, um, eventually we get airway wall matrix damage with the um, dilated airways that we see on radiography. Um, but we can intervene early and we can try and prevent the initial triggers, both through um, preventive um, strategies for pneumonia, but also in treating the risk factors um, and the underlying conditions that predispose children to getting these and, um, and then bronchiectasis. We can intervene early um, by, by early case recognition and hopefully get people off this, um, children off this trajectory. Or in children who already have airway damage, we can assess and manage them appropriately so we can prevent ongoing disease progression and improve improve their quality of life. This, um, gra this graphic um, is useful in showing the various different aspects in the cycle of inflammation and, um, and, and lung destruction, um, giving us some ideas of where one can intervene in your management and also where we need to know more about um, what the factors are that lead one child um, um, stuck in the cycle and another getting out of them.
Um, certainly, uh, so we've got chronic infection, which is neutrophil driven in bronchiectasis, although up to 30% of children have eosinophilic inflammation. And this is important to know in designing your management. The microbiome is clearly important as, it, as is the body's response to that. And understanding the role of viruses in bronchiectasis is not clearly understood. Um, impaired mucociliary clearance is a key part of this. Um, and this can um, cause or be a consequence of anatomical distortion and damage. And different causes are going to enter this um, destructive cycle at different points. Um, for example, tracheomalacia uh, or foreign body uh, will, uh, will, will block or distort airways and, and make infections more and inflammation more likely. And uh, we could have a primary ciliary dyskinesia, which is impairing the mucociliary clearance or severe pneumonia that's actually directly damaging airway mucosa or the body's response that makes it um, the, the it makes it difficult to get uh, yourself out of the cycle and all of the different causes importantly may give a different clinical phenotype so for example the foreign body may give you just an isolated uh, focal uh, damage which is going to be different to a child with immune deficiency who might have quite diffuse uh, Lung bronchiectasis from recurrent infection, infective insults, and it's this heterogeneity that makes it difficult um, to to know uh, uh, to plan management. So if we do need to identify cases early, how do we do that? Um, and there are key clinical symptoms that have been associated with CT confirmed bronchiectasis and identifying these and ensuring that these children get assessed for bronchiectasis is, an, is, a, is a key point. Um, so chronic wet productive cough has a very strong association with CT confirmed bronchiectasis as does chronic radiological change in chest x-rays, histories of recurrent pneumonia, feeding difficulties or recurrent episodes of chronic wet cough. Other clinical signs of bronchiectasis include clubbing, wheeze, chest pain, hemoptysis, failure to thrive, effort intolerance, chest deformity and crackles. And these are all described variably and probably relate to the severity of the disease as well as underlying uh, etiologies and risk factors. It's important that we align our definition of bronchiectasis um, and that this is pediatric focused. And currently the definition that is recommended is the, is, is, for children is that there's the classic clinical syndrome, um, which is the persistent and recurrent cough, as well as CT scan uh, defined bronchiectasis. For a pediatric def definition of bronchoarterial arterial ratio of greater than 0 0.8 with a good quality HRCT, so good volume using the inner bronchus and outer radius uh, to calculate the ratio. But as we've said, bronchiectasis is, is the end result of a continuum of destructive inflammation. And the um, and the clinical the clinical course uh, and severity of disease is strongly correlated with lung destruction. So it's not, so clinical acumen is is a key factor um, in, uh, in in defining the final outcome, not just the radiological picture. We know the term chronic psychotic lung disease being the clinical classic clinical syndrome, but without HRCT findings. But I want to raise what do we call the clinical syndrome, a child with a classic clinical syndrome, but with no access to HRCT findings, because this group is not necessarily the same as the chronic subjective lung disease group. And I think this group will be very familiar to many um, clinicians who are working in high prevalence areas. So you could have a child with a classic clinical syndrome and an obvious, an obvious bronchiectasis on chest x-ray. And, and this unfortunately we still see probably because of the severity of initial um, infection or poor access to the appropriate care or bad um, 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 delayed timing. And clearly these children need to be assessed and managed as, as having bronchiectasis. But more troublesome is the clinical children with the, cl the clear clinical syndrome, but uh, an, a clear or a normal or non-specific chest x-ray findings. And we know the chest x-ray findings are very non-specific non for bronchiectasis. They, they're not sensitive to picking up bronchiectasis. Um, and so these children may well have um, maybe even moderate bronchiectasis with, with, with a normal chest x-ray or relatively normal chest x-ray. And I believe that these children should be um, treated as possible bronchiectasis with the assessment and management and review.
Just to summarize the chest CT scan findings of bronchiectasis, those being the increased bron um, alveo bronchial arterial ratio, uh, lack of bronchial tapering or, uh, or tram line, presence of bronchial structure, structures in the periphery, bronchial wall thickening, mucus plugging, um, mosaic perfusion. And these pictures actually also include some of the complications of bronchiectasis, which is recurrent infections um, and pulmonary hypertension. Identifying the etiology of bronchiectasis is important as it can impact the management and also the prognosis. Um, and this, this shows global variation with high income countries showing much higher incidences of immune deficiency and primary ciliary ciliary dyskinesia compared to lower income countries tend to have more um, post-infectious uh, bronchiectasis and a higher um, rate of idiopathic disease, which probably reflects um, the lack of access to diagnostics. It's very important that in, in, in assessing a child for bronchiectasis that you consider, consider other concomitant diseases or syndromes, um, as these can either cause or exacerbate bronchiectasis, notably asthma, prematurity, um, non-post-infectious bronchiolitis obliterans, ABPA, and numerous other um, uh, systemic conditions. And changing epidemiology has also been described, particularly in low middle income settings, um, with less idiopathic and post infectious disease and more PCD and immune, deficient, um, and, and immune deficiencies identified. Uh, Eralp and colleagues um, from Turkey have recently published a, a comparative cohort of their more recent cohort uh, compared to a cohort 15 years ago and have shown that they have halved the amount of idiopathic um, cases in their cohort and quadrupled the number of PCD. And I'm sure this is an example of better understanding and access to investigations for underlying causes of bronchiectasis. But what about um, the South African experience? Um, this data is from um, Dr. Munta Muntanga Mapani's MPhil research. Um, she is a pediatrician from Zambia who is um, just finishing off her subspecialist training uh, here in Cape Town. Um, and she looked at bronchiectasis in 56 um, children who were attending General Respiratory Clinic over, over a, year, a period of a year. Um, and this um, represented 18% of the clinic patients. So it is a common, um, re a common cause of chronic respiratory illness. Um, Bronchiectasis was defined by clinical symptoms and radiographic evidence of bronchiectasis, and that included chest X-ray or HRCT um, as assessed by a pediatric radiologist. And um, the mean age of diagnosis was two years. So she found also that post-infectious was very common, but in our setting, uh, immune deficiency made up almost the same amount. And this was driven really by acquired immune deficiency um, from HIV. Um, there were no children with PCD, but this may relate to diagnostic access. And mo as expected, most children had a history of severe or recurrent low respiratory tract infections prior to the diagnosis of bronchiectasis. Um, but the cause, the infective cause of um, um, those events was different between the children living with HIV and those um, who, were, who are not. Um, so in children without HIV, adenovirus was the commonest cause of initial infection, 64%, um, with two thirds of these cases being in the setting of multiple co-infections, um, which really speaks to the severity of the initial insult. Um, and in HIV, um, children living with HIV, tuberculosis was by far the most common cause. Um, and, and even taking into account the difficult of definitive diagnosis of tuberculosis in HIV infected children, um, we know there's a lot of data, um, there's a, much data to show that tuberculosis is, um, a, a, children with, um, living with HIV are really susceptible to tuberculosis. And we know that chronic radiological change is common in children living with HIV. This has been shown. Bronchiectasis decrease attenuation being the most common findings. In a South African cohort of AM children living with HIV spanning the ART rollout period, 85% of the children had chronic radiological change change, 50% of which was extensive, but importantly, ART so was associated with improved radiological change. Um, bronchiectasis um, defined on CT has been shown to be common, up to 50% in sub-Saharan African adolescents um, with delayed access to ART and in living in a high TB prevalence area. And unexpectedly, and not unexpectedly, the risk factors for bronchiectasis in the setting are recurrent LRTIs, um, severe immune depression, suppression, and LIP.
Um, but as um, work by Rafiwe, uh, Masakela and others has, has also suggested um, that, they, that, that, this, that bronchiectasis may be in part due to HIV mediated effects in innate immunity and accompanying airway neutrophilic inflammation. Um, so, to summarize, your, our diagnostic approach is to identify children at risk of bronchiectasis as early as possible before irreversible airway damage has happened, to thoroughly investigate them for underlying etiologies, to assess base, baseline severity and risk factors and comorbidities, because these are going to define how you manage and, and plan the management um, of, of that individual. And this is nicely put out in a flow chart, um, which identifies this approach, which, which recommends this approach of identifying the key symptoms and all children with these symptoms get evaluated for bronchiectasis with a CT scan, if possible. If there's no bronchiectasis, reconsider your diagnosis, but manage appropriately, following up carefully to make sure that they're not on the continuum to airway destruction. Um, if they have bronchiectasis, all children should be investigated um, to exclude cystic fibrosis and immune deficiencies with selected assessment um, of other investigations based on the um, clinical, the history and the clinical signs and symptoms. Of note, I just want to make a comment that bronchoscopy should ideally be done in all children who've got focal disease, um, just uh, to ensure that they're not misfiring bodies or um, airway problems that need to and can be sorted out. But I'd like to suggest an adapted version to, um, to this presented flow chart um, for use in areas where CT scan is not readily available. Absolutely all children um, should be screened and um, for symptoms, uh, the key symptoms, and any child with these symptoms should be evaluated for bronchiectasis. If the chest x-ray shows a clear evidence of bronchiectasis, which unfortunately we do still see, uh, clearly they should be, be um, assessed um, for bronchiectasis and managed as such. All children living in high um, TB and HIV prevalence areas should be assessed for um, TB and HIV. And I would hope that already at the time of def um, defining these symptoms, this has been done. Um, if, the, if the chest X-ray is normal or not clear, um, then preferably as a chest CT scan um, should be done to assess whether there's early bronchiectasis and then to follow the relevant pathway. But in many cases where chest CT scan is unavailable and a child has a classic clinical syndrome, um, I think these children should be assessed as possible bronchiectasis managed accordingly and this diagnosis reviewed on response to treatment and follow-up. Assessment of baseline needs to include sputum, lung function, nutritional status, and immunization. I won't talk more on that in the interest of time. And once again, just to highlight the importance of assessment of comorbidities and exacerbations. This doesn't only impact on the, the long-term outcome, but also on the quality of life, which is so important in children, everybody. Um, so what is our way forward in tackling bronchiectasis in Africa? We clearly need to um, have well-designed studies to better understand the burden of disease, both the prevalence, etiology, and clinical outcomes. And for this, we need to align our definitions and our diagnostic approach and advocate for improved access to diagnostics, but to do this in a way that, um, that allows us to best understand how we can use these efficiently and effectively in our setting. We need to better phenotype disease subgroups so that the management and research can be better targeted. And we need to assess barriers to an impact of earlier diagnosis and the current proposed management strategies within our context. And so to this end, um, we formed the collaborative initiative that uh, Rafiwe mentioned at the beginning, um, which is the backpack study. This is between seven pediatric pulmonology services across four provinces. Uh, it's a two phase project and the first is to establish a clinical registry of all children known with bronchiectasis from any cause. Three of the sites have already piloted this registry and two sites um, have started data collection. And then we're hoping that the a number of sites will join the phase two, which is the prospective enrollment of children with chronic wet cough despite antibiotic treatment who are going to be um, ass assessed and managed a standard uh, approach. Uh, we obviously encourage work with our colleagues across um, Africa and would love to um, dream of a pan-African registry. 
our registry does align with the Embark approach and we hope that our data will contribute to the growing um, international knowledge of um, bronchiectasis in children. So in conclusion, bronchiectasis is an important and largely preventable cause of chronic lung disease in children. Untreated, it can lead to a lifelong trajectory of worsening severity and premature death in adulthood. So early intervention is key and can improve outcome. Case detection can be assisted through the identification of key symptoms that need to be actioned promptly. Diagnosis of bronchiectasis, bronchiectasis relies on both clinical symptoms and radiological confirmation. Currently, that's HRCT. Um, but remember, diagnostic assessment and intervention can be actioned without that HRCT, and in many cases should. It is a very heterogeneous disease, and this requires better phenotyping for us to improve our treatments and outcome. So with that, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen and um, let uh, Mareka take over um, with management. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diane, for a very comprehensive uh, presentation. We will take all the questions after the two presentations, so after Marijke finished her presentation. And please uh, put your questions in the question and answer box on the uh, bottom of your screen. So my name is Marielle Pijnenburg. I'm the current head of the Pediatric Assembly of the ERS, and I'm really happy to introduce to you Professor Marijke Proesmans. Marijke is a consultant in pediatric pulmonology at the University Hospital of Leuven in Belgium. Uh, Marijke received her degree in medicine in 1992 in Leuven, and after that she obtained a PhD degree in basic science. But actually now she is a very all-round pediatric pulmonologist, uh, seeing patients patients with all different uh, respiratory diseases, but her um, uh, research focus is mostly clinically oriented and uh, she has a strong focus on cystic fibrosis. And Marijke will talk about the management of children with non-CF bronchiectasis. Please Marijke, it's all yours. Thank you, Marielle. Uh, thanks to the organizers and to Refidoe for uh, inviting me to talk. And I'm really very humble for this uh, uh, public on the web. Um, and I have to admit that I have very little experience in the uh, African healthcare setting. So um, my knowledge is mainly based on the healthcare setting where I work in Europe. Um, and I've tried to um, find some evidence in the literature on management and I will do my best to also focus on different uh, healthcare settings. I have no conflicts of interest concerning this talk. Um, so the first part have been covered by Diane Gray and she covered most of these uh, uh, points that are listed here. I will, as said, uh, cover mainly management issue and also at the end have a small part, part on follow-up uh, quality of life and prognosis. Um, as Diane Gray already explained, or sorry, I have to start at what is the aim of the management of the non-CF bronchiectasis? Well, we want to uh, reduce the cough, persistent or recurrent wet cough in the children. We want to reduce the pulmonary exacerbations because we know that they impact on quality of life, but also on the lung damage and lung function. So we want to preserve lung function as much as possible and try to slow or prevent the progress progression of bronchiectasis and lung damage. Um, if we find etiology, we can also treat the etiology and address comor comorbidity. So as Diane Gray already explained, there is a problem with airway mucus clearance in the uh, vicious circle of the, uh, uh, in the origin of bronchiectasis. And so one uh, step in the uh, treatment is the use of medication to improve airway clearance. Um, we do a lot of translation from CF drugs, but we have to caution that not, not all uh, medicines that are effic efficacious in cystic fibrosis are, have the same efficacy in non-CF bronchiectasis. So um, what do we know on hypertonic saline? You can see here on the picture that hypertonic saline is a rehydrator of the airway or of the airway surface liquids. Um, 
and in the non-CF setting, uh, it has been shown in adults that these nebulizations have a positive effect on sputum properties and also on lung function, but we have unfortunately no data specifically in children. From the same uh, category, we have Manitol, which is also a, a hyperosmolar active uh, product that can be given in a dry powder inhaler. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, available in many countries, also not in the country where I work. Um, again, the most studies come from adult non-CF bronchiectasis, where it increases mucus clearers and improves sputum properties. Uh, no improvement in pulmonary function has been proven, and again, no data in children. And then DNAs or pulmozyme is a strict mucolytic medicine that cleaves the DNA uh, in the sputum of the airways and therefore has a strong mucolytic effect. It's a drug really designed for cystic fibrosis. There's some case reports in non-CF bronchiectasis, but we have to use it with care. It's expensive, there is no proof of benefit. And in adults, it can, in some diseases, even be potentially harmful. So we do not use it systematically in this context. Um, together with the medication to improve airway clearance, we can also use the uh, physiotherapy, airway physiotherapy or the airway clearance techniques. The aim is, of course, to improve, improve sputum expectoration and decrease chronic infection. And again, which is often frustrating, there is very little RCTs in children in this context. Many studies that are published come from adults, uh, where it has been shown that sputum expectoration and sputum volume are improved. And there's a Cochrane review combining adults and pediatric studies published in 2015, where they show that it's safe to do airway clearance techniques, it's potentially beneficial, uh, it's not clear what the role is in acute exacerbation, and as we know, additional studies are needed. The question is often which techniques do we have to uh, choose? Well, I think it has to be assessed individually. Um, the good news is that there is no added value proven of expensive aids like the, the vests or the covices, etc. And so cheap devices or even techniques without any devices uh, are, are most likely as efficacious. Uh, so often um, positive pressure or oscillating devices are used um, and you can also use a, a PEP in a, in a bubble water system so it doesn't have to be an expensive system and also other techniques like active cycle of breathing and assist cough technique, manually assist cough techniques can be helpful. What about asthma medication? So we talk about inhaled corticosteroids and short and long acting beta 2 agonists. Uh, at least in the country where I work, I think it's largely overused in this context. context. And from the figures that Diane showed, uh, about in 3% of children with non-CF bronchiectasis, asthma is a comorbidity. And I think in many of the other children, if there is no asthma, it's most likely not useful to use these medications. Uh, of course, if there is uh, a bronchospasm, you can relieve them, but I think the long-term treatment with inhaled steroids should be critically uh, reflected on. One of the cornerstone, uh, of, uh, cornerstones of the treatment of non-CF bronchiectasis is antibiotic treatment, uh, especially to treat acute exacerbation. And there, if it's possible, it should be guided by sputum culture. But I will come back on that, even if you don't have access to sputum culture, we know quite well which bacteria we most commonly find in this context. You can also use antibiotics on a long-term basis to prevent the exacerbations and to reduce lung function decline. Again, there is from the same Cochrane review in children and adults, it has been shown that long-term an antibiotic treatment reduces the risk for exacerbations by almost 50%. But you have to be aware that, of course, there is an, a risk of emergence of drug-resistant bacteria. Um, and um, comparison between oral or inhaled antibiotics is not possible based on the current studies. And especially for inhaled antibiotics, the uh, current evidence is insufficient to recommend their generalized use. Uh, I found a nice publication from South Africa where they looked at uh, the most isolated bacteria in sputum from non-CF bronchitis uh, children. And this is really very similar to, to what has been shown in other st studies in other contexts or other uh, continents. 
So we know that most often we culture Haemophilus influenzae, strep pneumoniae, and Moraxella catarralis, and rarely uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And the same uh, was found in South African children, of which about 80% had underlying HIV. So that translates into an antibiotic choice of amoxiclov, cefuroxim, and also macrolides, and I will come back on that. Uh, also, cotrimoxazole is uh, frequently used, but you have to be aware that is, there is a high resistance um, uh, in Moraxella for this antibiotic. Um, what do we know from studies? Well, Diane already talked about the uh, continuum of uh, projected bacterial bronchitis or projected uh, uh, productive cough and bronchiectasis. So this was a, a trial performed in, um, or published in 2012. Uh, a treatment of amoxiclov for three weeks, um, uh, sorry, a treatment of two weeks in children with a cough of at least uh, three weeks. You can see that the median age was quite low. So these were small children with cough for many weeks and um, about one third of them had X-ray abnormalities. Um, and this was compared to a placebo treatment. It was not a very large group, but important data. And you can see that uh, after the end of the treatment, there was a re resolution of cough completely in about half of the treated group and in a small proportion of the placebo group. And you see that the improvement of the cough score was uh, clearly improving over time in the treatment group. Um, Two important studies have been performed to compare the use of amoxicillin clavulanic acid or azithromycin in the treatment of acute non-severe exacerbations in non severe bronchiectasis. And with non-severe, the authors mean that there is no need for hospitalization. So in this first trial of this uh, group, they uh, treated for three weeks with either of these antibiotics. There was no placebo arm. And they looked at a resolution of the exacerbation at the end of treatment, and this was comparable for the two antibiotics used. So azithromycin was a non-inferiority trial, azithromycin was non-inferior to amoxiclov. However, when they looked at the uh, duration of the exacerbation, it was significantly shorter in the amoxiclov uh, group. And these were the uh, included children, so uh, a lot were post-infectious uh, bronchiectasis and a lot of idiopathic, so I think you also can translate this to the um, African situation. The same uh, group of uh, researchers published another trial where they cho choose for a shorter treatment duration of 14 days and compare placebo, amoxiclov, and azithromycin, again in non-CF bronchiectasis with a median age of six years, and again, non-severe exacerbations. And of course, children that were already on azithromycin maintenance, and I will come back on that as well, were excluded. However, uh, about a uh, maximum of 10% of these children already had some sort of antibiotic as maintenance therapy. And you can here see again, the bacteria that were cultured uh, are uh, very in alignment with what I've shown previously. Uh, in this study, it has been shown that the resolution of the exacerbation at the end of the treatment was similar in the amoxicillin flavulanic group and the azithromycin group compared to placebo. But again, the duration of the exacerbation was shorter, significantly shorter in the uh, amoxicillin clavulanic group compared to placebo. However, this was not statistically significant between the azithro and the placebo group. Um, the median time to the next ex exacerbation after resolution of symptoms was similar in all three groups. So the acute treatment did not, did not prevent next exacerbations. So again, the conclusion is that amoxiclav remains the first choice of the treatment of acute exacerbations in non-CF bronchiectasis. Then we come to the use of the macrolides as an anti-inflammatory therapy. Uh, it's important to know that macrolides have an excellent tissue and thus also lung penetration. They, apart from having a broad efficacy against many respiratory pathogens, they also have important anti-inflammatory properties. They inhibit the biofilm formation, which is an important aspect in chronic infection in bronchiectasis, and they also reduce mucus secretion. Azithromycin has the advantage that it doesn't, does not inhibit the CYP3A4 enzymes and does have very little interference with other medicines. It has a very long half-life, and so it's often the preferred macrolide in the studies. 
there's two um, reviews on the studies that have been performed of uh, macrolide therapy in onset bronchi bronchiectasis in children or in children and adults together. So in this summary published in 2019, three studies are reviewed, different lengths of therapy and different outcome param parameters, different macrolides as well. But as you can see, they all had some positive effects either on the sputum purulence, on the uh, lung function, um, airway hyperresponsiveness, the exacerbations, etc. Uh, in the same year, a meta-analysis was published uh, um, combining adult as well as pediatric studies, but I've indicated pe pediatric studies reviewed and one study also of Refilo um, in children uh, with different microlites, different uh, settings, Korea, South Africa and Australia, um, and uh, different therapy duration. In the meta-analysis, it has been clearly shown that combining these studies, there is a clear effect of uh, azithromycin on the uh, frequency and the number of pulmonary exacerbations. And this is then the uh, review of the adult and the uh, pediatric studies combined against showing an advantage for uh, azithromycin. Uh, the good news is that there is also data coming from Africa with a nice study published uh, just in 2020, um, looking at the effect of once weekly azithromycin versus placebo for 48 weeks, performed in two countries, Zimbabwe and Malawi, in children with HIV-associated chronic lung disease, um, with uh, HIV by a mother to child transmission. The primary outcome of this study was the fev one z score at 48 weeks, and secondary outcomes were the number of uh, acute exacerbations, time to first exacerbations, dead, hospitalization, etc. Unfortunately, the uh, primary outcome uh, did not reach signific significance, although there was a tendency for azithromycin to uh, improve lung function, but it was not uh, uh, significant. Uh, however, as has been shown in other studies, the most important effect of long-term azithromycin is the effect on exacerbations, the first, all exacerbations, and also all hospitalization. So important effect of this um, uh, studied drug. What are the adverse effects of long-term macrolides? Uh, of course, macrolide resistance in increases in adult studies uh, it has been looked at for different bacteria. In pediatric studies, there's mainly data on Moraxella um, uh, resistance. This is a study from Australia. Uh, and also some changes in airway microbiota with uh, some more isolation of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but this was not a pediatric study. Apart from the uh, mic microbiological effects, there's a little side effects, some small GI complaints. In this Australian study, uh, they also looked at the carriage of upper airway bacteria under a long-term azithromycin therapy. It was a study performed in Australia and New Zealand comparing azithromycin versus placebo. And it was found that in children treated, there was a lower carriage in the upper airway of, of Haemophilus and Moraxella, especially when the patients were very much adherent. So in the non-adherent group, there was little, little effect on the carriage. There was an increase in macrolide resistance in Stavoris and strep pneumonia, and this recovered after the end of therapy for strep pneumonia, but not for the Staph aureus. And the good news is that in the study, there was no increased isolation of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So coming to the uh, next uh, possible step of treatment is surgery. Um, uh, I really want to stress that surgery, it may be lobectomy or segmentectomy, is only indicated in case of localized disease and insufficient response to medical treatment. And it, you should really be very cautious if the underlying disease is progressive, such as in PCD. There are some pediatric studies available showing complete resolution of symptoms in half to uh, three quarters of the children. However, there's some, some complications and even mortality, so you really have to consider with care. <laughs> 
Our personal experience is that it can make a big difference if you select a case as well. And these are a few CT examples. Even we sometimes do it in PCD, even in cystic fibrosis, which is of course not the topic of this talk. Uh, and then uh, in cases of immunodeficiency and localized disease, or this, this case and um, pneumococcal deficiency and chronic aspiration. But again, uh, only very uh, selective indications. Diane Gray already talked a bit on follow-up, and I think this is really an important issue that once you diagnose, you have to take these children by hand and follow them up. Um, and I think the baseline follow-up is mainly clinical. Uh, take a good history on cough exacerbations, review the therapy and talk about adherence because this is so difficult, even with a simple therapy like isotromycin, it's very difficult to uh, continue on having good adherence. Clinical exam, um, spirometry, if old enough and if, if, if available, can be an important measure. And I think every time you see ch a child, you have to look again at comorbidities and maybe new diagnostic clues, because sometimes these clues come only with the child aging. Um, and then we come to the point of radiology that or, or, uh, already has been talked about by Diane. Um, and I... Um, I know that it's very difficult in a lot of healthcare settings to have access to these uh, radiology, but I think for the settings where it is available, it's important to know that CT is superior to a chest X-ray and superior to lung function for the assessment and the monitoring of pediatric bronchiectasis. And also that low-dose CT protocols have the uh, similar radiation doses comparable to, to chest X-ray. So if you have it and you can choose, then it's better to do a less frequent CT than a frequent X-ray with uh, far less information. A lot of CT scoring systems have been developed, um, for example, for cystic fibrosis, but TCF scoring systems may not be always appropriate for other causes. And for example, it has been shown that bronchiectasis in PCD look much different than bronchiectasis in cystic fibrosis. And of course, this is very high tech pulmonary MRI uh, with or without hyperpolarized gas, but this is only for very uh, specific uh, dedicated centers and is something that we also not have available uh, here. And it's still more in research. And then in sake of time, I will go very quickly now because of course this is this as an important impact on quality of life. And there is some study data on this also very recently. I give you the uh, reference uh, where it's shown that in this cohort of children that are not that dramatically diseased, there's already a clear impact in the children and in the adolescents on different aspects of quality of life, also on global functioning expectations, pain and happiness. So it's important that we take this in mind. And again, there is a review on this topic as well. Uh, talking about prognosis, we know very, very little. And we have to realize it's a, it's a mixed group. So it's a basket group of different diseases that have one thing in common, that they have bronchiectasis. So it's very difficult to talk about prognosis. Mortality data mostly, mostly come from adult data. This is a, a study from uh, uh, our center looking at mortality in adults, which is, which is quite high, 20% over five years, but a lot of COPD, so very different from pediatric. Also survival on lung transplant list has been studied, where luckily the mortality is much lower compared to uh, CF, but that is as little as we know. So with this, I come to the end of my talk uh, on the management of non-CF bronchiectasis uh, in children. I think the different aspects that we have to take uh, uh, into account our airway mucus clearance with or without medication, with airway clearance techniques, um, the important use of antibiotics for acute exacerbations where uh, for most patients amoxiclav will be a good antibiotic and a first-line choice. Some children may need a maintenance antibiotic therapy. Nowadays, this maintenance therapy has largely been replaced by the use of long-term macrolides treatment, since it also has an anti-inflammatory anti aspect apart from the antibiotic uh, effects. The main effect is a reduction of exacerbation, uh, and of course, we have to monitor macrolide resistance. Surgery is only for really rare cases, and I think quality of life and prognosis this will depend on underlying disease severity, comorbidity, etc. But I think it's um, important that in uh, every continent we do more studies on these uh, difficult group of non-CF bronchitis. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>
Nam Rijk, uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. It was a really beautiful overview on the management of non-CF bronchiectasis. There are quite a lot of questions and I tried to group them uh, a little bit. Um, so maybe I will start with some questions to Diane on the uh, diagnosis and uh, diagnostics of cystic of uh, non-CF uh, bronchiectasis. Um, there were some questions about the pragmatic definition of recurrent pneumonia, as this might be a precursor of non-CF bronchiectasis. How would you define a recurrent pneumonia? And in the same, um, well, same sort of a question, also, um, how, how can you make the difference between persistent uh, bacterial bronchitis and um, the start of non-CF bronchiectasis? Thank you very much for those questions. Um, to answer the first question, um, so we know that it's the current recurrent inflammatory insults and they may be viral or um, they're all bacterial. So I would say that a pragmatic approach would be um, using a very sensitive, def sensitive definition of a, a, a pneumonia. So fever and respiratory distress um, for three or more episodes in a year. Um, that's not always such an easy um, thing to to clarify. Um, histories can be difficult um, when children haven't been admitted, but severity is also very key in the development of bronchiectasis. So, um, you know, I think that what I always teach, but I also think is a really good practice is that any child who's been admitted for pneumonia of any severity should be followed up to complete resolution. And if they have persistent symptoms, um, that, you know, that's also important. But I think to answer the question that was asked, um, I would say um, that, 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 that three or more episodes of fever and respiratory distress in a year needs to, needs to be, the child needs to be seen. Um, the, 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 the question of PBB and on the continuum, I mean, the definition of protracted bacterial bronchitis is really the chronic cough in a child that's completely well um, with no chest extra evidence um, of bronchiectasis and who responds to antibiotic treatment. So I suppose if you think of it on this continuum of inflammation, they're the easier to treat. Um, and, 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 and whereas the chronic separative lung disease, um, children will not respond to antibiotics as, um, or, or will, will continue to recur. So remember that you can respond initially, but it, it, it comes back again. Thank you so much. There are quite some questions about CT scanning. Um, do you think ACT is needed in every child with a retained foreign body? to look for bronchiectasis thereafter? You know, I really think that that's a clinical, that, that depends on the clinical diagnosis. So if you remove the foreign body um, and the child completely recovers with no symptoms and a normal chest X-ray, then it's probably not indicated. So I would be guided by um, the clinical symptoms and the chest X-ray of the child. But they clearly need to be followed because they're at risk of airway, you know, ongoing airway obstruction from granulation tissue. And can you also say something about the distribution of uh, bronchiectasis on the CT? Can, this, can that give an indication of the cause of uh, bronchiectasis? Yeah, that's a nice question and, a, and, and, and one that would be good to discuss with radiologists. Um, yes, I mean, I think one of the, benef the, the clinical benefits of doing a CT are to pick up early bronchiectasis, to, get, to look at the distribution so that it could um, give you some idea of the etiology. Um, for example, focal lesions being airway, um, um, dependent lesions being aspiration, um, diffuse lesions um, su suggesting uh, um, ABPA or, or, or central versus peripheral lesions, um, uh, but also to look for complications that you might not expect, such as if you've got cystic bronchiectasis, fungal balls, or intercurrent infections and so on, pulmonary hypertension. Thank you. Uh, you also talked about um, a more eosinophilic, uh, eosinophilic inflammation in bronchiectasis. 
Um, how would you diagnose that? And are there specific causes for bronchiectasis in patients with eosinophilic inflammation, except for asthma, maybe? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, the studies have been done that have shown that on um, bronchial alveolar lavage, um, and I think you know the, on, the, we we need to better understand whether um, peripheral uh, eosinophilia would um, would 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 uh, be suffice. But as I, as it stands, I would say you'd need um, the bronchial alveolar lavage to to define that. Um, I'm not, I mean, I feel like I'm hogging the microphone a bit. I'm not sure, Mareke, if you would like to comment on that or refer where. Um, yeah, I think in the, in, in our uh, context, we see more neutrophilic than eosinophilic inflammation. Um, if I would see a lot of eosinophilia, I would certainly exclude underlying allergies uh, or maybe ABPA-like disease uh, and other causes of eosinophilic disease. But the, the more classical presentation would be the neutrophilic disease. Um, I would do a sputum examination also for the type of inflammation, but of course many young children will not uh, expectorate their sputa. And so doing sputum induction, it's um, quite time consuming and it's something that's not always successful. And as you said, not all children um, will undergo a bronchoscopy with lavage, so often you don't know. Um. Uh, one of the questions also, oh, sorry, Rafael, please. I think there's quite a number of questions related to azithromycin, Mareka. So uh, it's questions around duration of use. Uh, how long can you give azithromycin for? Is it lifelong? Is it for a number of months? What would be the recommendation? The other question as around azithromycin is uh, what, how, what duration would you suggest? I think you probably covered it in the talk, whether you'd go for 14 days or 21 days uh, in an acute exacerbation. And there's also another question around the role of uh, resistance uh, with the use of azithromycin. Okay. So I, I try to, to answer them separately. So when you talk about azithromycin maintenance therapy, um, then the duration, I think, has been really individual, individualized. I think once you start it and suppose the child becomes completely asymptomatic, then we often try to stop it and see if the complaints come back. And then in our setting, we would then, for example, do that when the summer starts and when there is less infections and we would have like a, uh, try to have a window azithromycin free and often we have to restart it again in the infectious season. Uh, but it really depends on the severity and the underlying disease. And I think if necessary, you can give it for years in a row, like we do in cystic fibrosis. Uh, it's well tolerated. And some of the children will have, will have a relapse of cough and sputum production every time you stop the azithromycin and have a good symptom control when you restart it. Um, but often the parents decide for themselves when the child is really well for quite a while, then they will ask you, well, do I need to give it? Or they, they tell you that they stopped when they come back on consultation. So, but I think this needs to be individualized. I also saw a question on the, on the dosing. I think we still don't know. We usually give it three times a week, but if you look at the African study, it has been done given in one weekly dose, which is of course for adherence um, advantages, advantages. So um, I think because of the long half-life, you probably only need one or one to three doses, but there have no, not been studies comparing these different dosing uh, schemes. So then you have to, to choose depending on adherence. And then the other question was on the duration of the treatment for exacerbations. Um, there we usually treat for two weeks, um, also because often you see with, with the third week then the adherence beco becomes less. Uh, but again, then I would preferably not use azithromycin, but uh, as has been concluded from the studies, I would prefer to guide uh, with amoxiclav or other directed antibiotics depending on the sputum culture. There was also one question, uh, Marijke, which I think is interesting as well. In the patients with CF, we are a little bit afraid of resistance of non-tuberculous mycobacteria if you treat with azithromycin for a long period of time. Do you think that's a problem in children with non-CF bronchiectasis as well? Or should we check first non-tuberculous mycobacteria? It's something that we do not systematically do. We see 
very little, if almost non non, non uh, TB mycobacteria in non CF bronchectasis. For example, in in PCD or immune deficiency, I've I don't think I've seen a case. So I think our, our worry would be much bigger in CF than in non-CF bronchiectasis. But again, that can, of course, depend on the healthcare setting. And so I refer to my South African colleagues because I can imagine that before you started, you would exclude active TB disease also. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, certainly. Um, but we can concur, we see um, non-tuberculous mycobacteria very rarely. Okay, there's also a question around use of inhaled treatments. Uh, one question was around the role of um, DNAs and why, uh, you know, which study, I think there's two questions around the DNAs. Uh, why is it not recommended in, in non-CF bronchiectasis? And um, there's also another question around uh, the use of long-acting beta agonists as well as short-acting beta agonists in, in, in non-CF bronchiectasis. Uh, Mareka, do you want to take that one? I think concerning the DNAs, um, I think the most important issue is that we do not have proof of benefit and it's an expensive medicine. It costs about 30 euro per dose. Uh, and as I said in the presentation that in adults, it have, even has been shown that uh, some patients do worse with uh, DNAs. We don't know why but it's, it has clearly been shown that you cannot translate the CF effects to non-CF effects. And uh, I think, again, more studies are needed, but I think one of the issues is uh, that in many cases of non-CF bronchiectasis, it's not really, really the, the thickness of the mucus that's uh, comparable to CF. Uh, and then again, it depends on the underlying disease because, for example, in primary ciliary dyskinesia, the sputa are not thick or very sticky and so there I would not see a, a, an issue of giving, giving a medicine like, like DNAs. But of course if you have a patient that would really have like thick mucus plugs you could give it a, a try if you can afford it. But for example in Belgium it would not be reimbursed outside cystic fibrosis and since we have no data. So uh, I think you really have to um, yeah, consider the cost and the, the possible effect or the, the uh, absence of effect. And then what was the other question again? Sorry. Um. I think on the inhaled antibiotics, uh, quite some questions on that as well. Yeah. Um, there again, is the, I think the issue is the lack of evidence, but uh, I think in the individual patients, we would do it. Uh, and um, but it's really without any scientific background or evidence. And for example, in a patient with non-CF bronchi bronchic disease, where we would like to eradicate pseudomonas as we do in, in cystic fibrosis, then we sometimes use inhaled cholestin or tobromycin. But again, it's, it's yeah, just trying to do the best for individual patients where it's possible, but really with no evidence whatsoever. I think but there was a interesting yeah. question. Thanks, yeah. sorry. Uh, for dye, around um, where people have no access to CT scan, um, lung, uh, the use of lung ultrasound, I, I thought that was an interesting one to address. And I think the one about MRI Mareka did address in her talk. Thanks. Um, yes. So, um, I, I, my understanding is the, the lung ultrasound is not very sensitive on, on picking up um, airway problems, certainly not central um, bronchiectasis, um, certainly has a role in consolidation and, and, and pleural effusions, but not, 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 not bronchiectasis. So I would imagine that the chest x-ray would still be superior to an ultrasound, um, which is inferior to a CT scan. Um, but, you know, I think there was a question I haven't been able, I want to, been trying to listen and answer questions. Um, this, this is what we do need to try and work out is how could, you know, how do we, how, who needs a CT scan if you can only give a few? And so what are the, the strongest predictors? Can we score children on symptoms um, and chest x-rays uh, and, and, how, and how can we pick who needs them? 
um, you know, I, th I think the, 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 the difficulty is that um, CT scan is best at picking up um, early to moderate, and you do want to pick up those children. But if they've got clinical symptoms, you can treat empirically um, and see whether you can reverse the process early. Yeah. And I, I now saw a question coming up, and that was the other question, the, the, the indication for uh, LABA and LAMA. That was the other question, yeah. Um, well, as I said, I think you always have to look for underlying asthma. If that's not the case, I think there may be an indication for bronchodilator therapy, short or long acting, if the patient symptomatically improves with it. So I mean, if there is a clinical signs of uh, reversible uh, lung obstructive airway disease. So for example, if a child has wheezing and the wheezing results when you give a bronchodilator, this may well be a symptomatic treatment, even if there is no underlying asthma. But uh, in the populations I see, uh, bronchospasms is not a very common symptom that but may be different in other settings. So um, maybe Dai or Rifilwe can comment on that as well. I mean, no, I mean, I would, I would say the same. I think just, just a comment around the wheezing and air, airway obstruction in bronchiectasis. You know, always make sure that the children after spirometry have actually it tends to clear out the airways and then reassess and see whether, because um, you know, wheezing and obstruction doesn't necessarily only be um, um, bronchospasm, mm -hmm. but also occlusion of the airways with mucky secretions. Yes, I think that's also important. We found that very few pip, uh, kids actually in, in one of our studies actually had airway reversibility. So it's important. Um, there is a question around use of spirometry now in the world, but of course, during normal times, you should really do spirometry and uh, assess for irreversibility. Yeah. I saw a question coming up on uh, if there is azithromycin resistance, what antibiotic would you uh, prefer for long-term long -term treatment? I think an important remark there is that the azithromycin resistance is not often a problem for the individual patient is more a population problem because the, I think the main effect from azithromycin maintenance is not the antibiotic effect, it's the anti-inflammatory and anti-secretive effect. Because as you see in cystic fibrosis, it, it has a clear effect in children that are chronically infected with pseudomonas and it does not have anti, any antibiotic effects uh, towards pseudomonas. So, and often you would not know, of course, that you have azithromycin resistant for a moraxella, for example. Um, so, um, I think you could still use azithromycin as a maintenance, but you have to be careful when there is an acute exacerbation that you then do sensitivity testing for the acute treatment. Um, that's, I think we often do not know that there is resistance. No. There were also some questions on uh, vaccinations, uh, Marijke. Uh, do you uh, recommend routine immunization against influenza and pneumococcal? We do advise a yearly flu vaccination for children with severe chronic lung disease, so including non severe bronchiectasis, and it's taken up quite well. Um, concerning the pneumococcal vaccination, um, they of course, have the conjugated vaccine in their routine immunization as a baby. And we often give once the uh, polysaccharide vaccine, but more also as an immunological testing to see if they have an adequate antibody response. Uh, but we do not revaccinate with the conjugated vaccine uh, every five years. Excuse me, I have a. <coughs> Maybe in the meantime, I can ask uh, Diane, uh, what percentage of bronchiectasis do you think could be prevented by vaccinations in Africa? <laughs> Maybe well, very difficult. Yeah, that, I, I, I mean, a tricky question. Uh, clearly, if you're preventing, um, if you, it, it, vaccinations prevent acute infections. So you are going to have an impact on, on children who are susceptible to bronchiectasis. But it is a complex issue because not every child who gets a pneumonia ends up on the trajectory um, of chronic inflammation. Difficult to be precise, but clearly it's important. Yeah. 
I think the, the important, the one question was around measles. So obviously that would vent, yes, absolutely. But um, the rest, I mean, TB, you know. Um, I mean, if we could get a vaccination to prevent TB, that would be, uh, have a big impact on bronchiectasis. Okay, so I think we addressed a lot of questions and if there are questions left, please send us an email. Uh, I'm sure that Diane or Marijke or Rafilewe or me are happy to answer your remaining uh, questions. I think this was a really very successful webinar. Thank to all of you. Uh, you asked a lot of questions, which makes it uh, very interactive. So very much appreciated. There have been very uh, uh, more than 300 participants. So I think it's a good success for our first ERES Thoughts webinar. So I would like to thank the speakers who did really did an excellent job. I learned a lot this evening. And I would like to uh, thank uh, Refilo and Masekela for uh, asking ERES to do this um, collaborative webinars. I think uh, it, it's a very good idea. We can learn a lot from each other in Europe and Africa. Um, so I once again want to mention our next webinar, which is on April 15, and it's on uh, reducing the burden of community acquired pneumonia in children. So I really hope to see all of you again in April. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening and hope to see you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat>